if you are the sort of person who tends to read an author starting at the book one, page one, and assuming you've read any of Thomas Ligotti, then you probably have read The Frolic, since it's the first story in his first collection, Songs of a Dead Dreamer. It is a fairly simple story overall. You have a Dr. David Monk. He is a psychiatrist working with criminals, and he's become disheartened, dis disillusioned. Um, he's come to hate both his job and the people he's working with. One patient in particular, a John Doe, has unraveled Dr. Monk's sensibilities. John Doe has done horrible things to children, things left mostly to the average reader's imagination. And since the average horror reader has one hell of imagination, Ligotti has condemned those children to fates quite unwritable. But John Doe does not regret this. John Doe does not feel like a victim. John Doe revels in what he has done. He calls it frolicking. That's the word he likes to use. Frolic. Where most people see dead and discarded bodies of children left rotting in a field, John Doe sees awestruck companions coming along with him on a journey to cosmic slums, to jagged heaps in shadow, to starless cities of insanity. And John Doe is getting ready to go frolicking again. This story is a somewhat tangential glimpse into what Ligotti writes. It's plainer than a lot of his stories, simpler, more normal. Thomas Ligotti himself admits this. He describes it as an attempt to write a normal story from a normal perspective that he wrote when he was having trouble getting stories closer to his own weird idiom published. This is not to say it's a bad story. Um, it's just different. I kind of like it. The Frolic does offer glimpses, though, into other works by Ligotti. John Doe, for all of his psychotic, child-killing ways, is a fool character, a proto-clown, a direct metaphor for life's absurdist spiral. He is the unsolvable horror. He is a cipher of violence and death, but also a representative of all and otherworldliness. In the amazingly named uh, Smiles of Oblivion, Demonic Clowns, and Doom Puppets as the Fantastic Figures of Absurdity, Chaos, and Misanthropy in the Writings of Thomas Ligotti, author Jason Mark Harris points out that the story ends with a burst of laughter. Because, you see, it's all been a joke. A great, big, horrible, terrifying joke. Which would be the worst punchline? that John Doe is actually a supernatural creature or that he is just a madman preying upon children who he thinks are his friends. Both seem to be some form of cosmic horror in the first, the supernatural, or at least the natural above humanity is real and it is terrifying. In the other, it is simply just a no one doing no thing, born in no place, and living for no time. This brings us to the question of debate for this episode. Is the frolic Lovecraftian? Now, what does Lovecraftian mean? It is a term that has been somewhat muddled in recent years, and I say this plainly as a guy who wrote a semi-serious blog post about how the Blair Witch Project was a Lovecraftian film, and I'll put the link in the de description. Any particular answer to the question, what is Lovecraftian, seems to include things that don't, on the surface or even deeper down, feel Lovecraftian, and also to exclude things, such as some of the works of Lovecraft himself, that should definitely seem to pass. Thinking about it, I've split it up into layers. And this isn't 
all of the potential layers that make something Lovecraftian. These are just sort of the prominent ones that I would identify the most often. The first one, the cosmic layer, um, the philosophical layer, is simply the idea that the Lovecraftian universe is one that is neglectful of humanity. It's one that is characterized by a sense of despair over the chance of finding meaning in the universe at large, at least a meaning that humanity can reconcile with. It is not a layer that tends to show up directly in a lot of Lovecraftian stories, but it does seem to make an underpinning for stories such as uh, The Shadow Out of Time, for instance. It also shows up in several of his letters and his other writings. The second layer, where you're beginning to see uh, more of a proper definition, is the mythogenic layer, a Lovecraftian universe is able, for whatever reason, to spawn these beings and races of immense power. And the mechanics of these beings and races aren't necessarily perfectly in line with humanity. And they're born in places where the rules of the universe seem different, or they live at angles or at layers of the universe where sane people cannot reach. And these beings can be malignant to humanity at least as much as humanity is, say, malignant to cattle or ants. A third layer would be the Lovecraftian subversion of what later, like after Lovecraft, became known as the monomyth, the hero's journey. In the hero's journey, you have a hero who makes a journey, eventually, by overcoming obstacles, meets the goddess, receives a boon, and then returns home. And the hero is made by the journey, and the hero makes the journey possible. In Lovecraft, the journey unmakes the hero. Another layer is the use of external attributes, architecture, geography, physiognomy, to describe internal turmoil. This usually gets brought up with the Innsmouth look kind of arguments, or some of his more racist writings, but you also see it a lot in his architecture. Lovecraft's heroes witness vistas, cyclopean, with non-Euclidean architecture and angles that go off in the wrong direction because the universe itself is too big, too weird, and too inhuman to fully comprehend. Truth is terror. Of course, there's also the layer of specific trappings in which some of these semi-gods have names like Cthulhu and Shubnagurath and Nyarlet Hotep, and there are cities with names like Arkham and Dunwich and Innsmouth, and there are books with names like the Necronomicon. And none of these layers specifically seem to make something properly Lovecraftian, in that you could have a stuffed Cthulhu figure that is most definitely a reference to Lovecraft, but is not Lovecraftian in the way that it makes you feel insignificant and small like the Cthulhu from the short story mind. These layers have to work together. The melodramatic architecture does not make a Lovecraftian story, neither does Azathoth, neither does an uncaring universe, but as these elements start working together, you start seeing something that you can feel more comfortable with declaring full-on Lovecraftian. Going back to the frolic, you do see many of these layers. The universe that John Doe describes is dark and inhuman. The inability of the house to protect the family is representative of the inability of the family to protect itself. Even if John Doe isn't a particular mythos entity and the other place he describes isn't a particular mythos place, there still is that mythogenic layer of something born out of the universe that is vast and terrible. In the story, there are hints more specifically Lovecraftian 
John Doe is described as having a thousand other names. His face and voice and accent changes almost uncontrollably or seemingly uncontrollably. Um, Dr. Monk even mentions the Dreamlands. And it's not hard to picture those aforementioned starless cities of insanity being somewhere just south of Kadath, deep in the wastes. There is no moral to the frolic. And really the only hope is that John Doe is somewhat right and frolicking is something more, and that hope is an awful one. Lovecraft's Heroes. Ooh, there's some messy glasses. <laughs>